Hello and welcome again to another edition of Matters of the Heart, brought to you by Pentucket Medical Associates Cardiology and Haverhill Community Television. Today I'm with my associate, Dr. Sunny Srivastava, and we're going to be talking about a, a disease entity or problem that we haven't discussed, a, a problem with the heart valves, a common problem that we see in elderly patients. Uh, this problem is called aortic stenosis. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts and on what we can teach the public about aortic stenosis. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, as you mentioned, aortic stenosis is a valve problem. And to start, it probably makes some sense to talk about what heart valves are and what they do in the heart. And so I have a, a, a graphic to show that maybe help explain this. It uh, details the anatomy of the heart. So maybe we could put that up. And this may take a few minutes to walk through this. Um, it's a little detailed, certainly. But the, um, the heart is made up of four chambers. There are upper chambers called atria, and there are lower chambers called ventricles. And there are valves between those chambers that just act as doorways to regulate blood flow through them. And so on this diagram, on the left side of your screen, you see two bluish veins going back to the heart called the uh, superior vena cava or inferior vena cava. And they bring back blood from the body after the body has used up the oxygen. And the blood enters into the right atrium. It's one of the chambers. Blood then flows through the heart uh, through a valve called the tricuspid valve, and that acts as a doorway. It opens and closes to let blood go through. And the blood ultimately works its way through the lungs and back to the other side of the heart, which is the left side of the heart. But on this diagram, it's on the right side of your screen. And ultimately, when the heart is ready to pump the blood out to the body in its oxygenated state, it goes through the last valve. It's uh, called the aortic valve. And that is the valve that helps control the blood flow from the heart out to the main artery of the body called the aorta. And then the, that delivers blood to the rest of your body where you need it. Um, that valve is typically made up of three leaflets. That make, and so it's referred to often as a tricuspid valve. So a cusp is a leaflet. Um, and so it's... Um, let me just ask this okay. to make sure I get it so that we, for, we can review for the audience. So, so basically you mentioned that there's four chambers which are like rooms that, mm -hmm. that the blood flows through. Mm -hmm. So blood sort of goes from room to room or chamber to chamber. Yep. And the separation between these chambers are the valves. And just like doorways. Yep. Like doorways, exactly. So when you leave one room, you close the door and go into the next room and blood sort of progresses through these different chambers. Right. And if functioning properly, the door closes and nothing goes backwards. And if functioning properly, the door opens. Well, opens and, fully. and you go forward properly. Okay, great. Absolutely. And this is where, go ahead. So one see. of these valves that we're talking about today is the aortic valve, which is the sort of final door, the, the final exit door, like the front door going out of the house. Yep. So we might say it's the main outlet valve of the heart yep. going out into the main pipe of the heart called the aorta. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about that as the, as the valve we're talking about is called the aortic valve today. Right. Okay. Right. And so of course there are other valve problems, but we're going to focus in on the aortic valve today. Okay. And it's obviously, a, well maybe not obviously, but it's an important valve as it's yeah. the outlet valve and regulates blood flow to the body. And there's a condition that's well described and well known and, and not uncommon called aortic stenosis. And that's a fancy way of saying basically that the valve is narrowed or doesn't open as well. So that okay. door does not open well. It does okay. not allow blood to exit as well as one would like it to. Okay. And it is more often than not a disease entity associated with aging. Uh, it's said that uh, once one is 65 years or older, 2% of the population will have this condition. At age 75 or older, it's 3%. 85, it's 4 or 5%. So it increases with age. Sure. And the but as you said, not insignificant. So 1 out of 50 people over 65 yeah. will have it. Yeah, so and that's a lot of people. A lot of people. So no doubt about it. We, I think not a day goes by in the office where I don't see somebody with some degree of this, right. certainly. Okay. Um, so over 65, too. And so the, I guess we would also might say that the thing that's happening here is that the valve is, instead of, uh, if we think about sort of what happens to other tissues in human life, we think about an infant how the tissue has such soft and supple uh, and, uh, uh, tissue, and then sometimes older individuals, even the skin might be a little more firm, less soft, and that's actually what's happening to the valve. That's precisely what's happening. As we age, uh, the valve acquires cal it calcifies or thickens and doesn't open as well. And a lot of that is due to you know, turbulent, you know, there's a lot of blood flow going through there, it's turbulent, and over the years, the, the calcium can deposit there and, and cause it to thicken. So calcium is so, something that's made, 
you can make uh, a, a salt or crystals out of or stone. Mm -hmm. So it's actually like almost like a petrification, like a petrified yeah. force. Yeah. So it's hardening this this tissue that's normally very soft, like very soft skin, mm -hmm. becomes very thickened, and that's the process we're dealing with here. Exactly, and this, uh, you know, it gets worse as we get older, certainly. Okay. Uh, there, and that's the most common cause of this, by far, the most common cause of this. Um, there are other entities that can cause this as well, and one of them that is well known and not uncommon either is something referred to as a bicuspid aortic valve. So earlier I had mentioned that the uh, aortic valve is typically made up of three leaflets, tricuspid valve. Mm -hmm. uh, rarely, in about, uh, it's not so rare actually, in about 1 to 2% of the adult population, they were actually born with an aortic valve that has two leaflets. Okay. So it's referred to as a bicuspid aortic valve. So you may ask, well, what's the big deal? It doesn't make a difference, two leaflets versus three, but it does make a difference. The way the blood flows through there alters the, the local hemodynamics and the turbulence that's generated there, and that can lead to premature thickening and restriction of those leaflets as well. Okay. So for the most part, if one has a bicuspid valve or these two leaflets, they end up doing just fine, that they may not have any problems and may not ever really know about it. In fact, about two-thirds of folks with it have no problems whatsoever. Uh, the other third can ultimately de develop a narrowed valve or stenotic valve, as we refer to it as, uh, this problem, aortic stenosis. Um, actually, I should, I should rephrase that. Another third develop a problem with the valve. Some people can develop leakiness of the valve as well. We're not going to get into that too much right now, but some people can develop leakiness. Some people can develop narrowing as okay. well. So those are the two most common causes by far, and really, I think, encompass the majority of cases. There are other rare causes that people could have where if they've had rheumatic fever as a child. Um, that very uncommon in our country. Right now, it's very uncommon, especially with the advent of antibiotics and how frequently right. people are taking antibiotics. So rheumatic fever is something that was more common in the uh, earlier part of the last century in the United States from a Untreated kind of bacteria, strep. from streptococcus or strep infections. Right. It struck fear in the hearts of our grandparents and our great-grandparents, but with the advent of antibiotics, we don't see it anymore, but we do see it as I know you're familiar with, in some immigrant populations from Asia and South America where th there isn't the same availability for antibiotics. And the mo I, th I think the most common valve affected by that is usually one called the mitral valve, a, a different valve here, but sure. it also can affect the aortic valve as well. And you often see both valves involved, certainly. Um, so I haven't seen a lot of that re around here recently by okay. any means. So, so basically, just to review what you said, and maybe we can show the graphic while we're talking here and look at the graphic of the aortic valve, the next graph that we have while we're talking. But there's two main types of aortic valve problems, I think you said. Yep. And uh, on the top picture, I think you've, sh you've, you've already discussed in great detail, a normal valve that has three leaflets. Right. And, and that picture shows it wide open. It's open and the blood's flowing through. Right. And then on that same graphic, just below it, there's the one, it, it looks almost like a... Uh, a football shape. Yeah, uh, uh, it's standing on end, getting ready for a field goal attempt right. or something. So it's, um, and those are two leaves, and that again is open with the blood going through as well. So, so the one on the top, three leaflet valve, if that was going to get to be a problem, the most common thing would be to happen in, a, in an older patient, mm -hmm. over 65, over 75. We have patients we're, we're following longer, yeah. in the 85. I have several patients I'm following in their 90s who are walking around doing great, but have this problem with older patient aortic valve narrowing mm -hmm. from what was a normal valve at birth, but now has gotten thickened. Right. And the other thing that you showed in that graphic, and the other one, was in a patient who was born with, instead of these three leaflets, which is normal, or tricuspid, two leaflets, right. which is the one that you showed right. there with what looks like the football, and because of that sort of fish mouth opening, there's, there's a likelihood of scarring. Tell us a little bit about when those patients yeah, might so show right. up so with Yeah, that's a, a great question or a great point that uh, it's a little different. So you're born with that, and more often than not, you aren't aware of it until it's picked up. And we'll talk about how these things can get picked up upon. Uh, but these can develop problems at a slightly younger age. More often, we talk about people in their late 40s, early 50s often developing problems. And ultimately, um, if these folks need something corrective done, a surgery done, it's often done at a much younger age than the other type, the calcifying type. Um, so so what decade of life are you talking so about? So usually late 50s or early 60s. Okay. Is so when much somebody, earlier. Yeah, so much 20 earlier. 20 years certainly. or so. Yeah, absolutely yeah. much earlier. Uh, and so it, um, it, uh, it's important to make the distinction, to know the, the difference between the two, certainly. Okay. All right. So I think maybe, uh, maybe a next place to go with this and talk about this is how do we pick this up or how do we diagnose this? Okay. Um, 
or maybe you should even talk about what the symptoms are people might have. And so more often than not, when you're picking this up, I think people don't have any symptoms often. And they go see their doctor for a routine physical exam. And part of that exam involves listening to the heart, of course. And there is a certain characteristic heart murmur that we can hear that's often indicative of this problem. Okay, so let's stop there. You just yeah. used a word that often brings up questions in the office. You just used this word. It's murmur. Mm -hmm. What is a murmur? Does a murmur is a murmur always a bad thing? Is a murmur a sign? Just tell me some general thoughts that the public should know yeah. about if they hear they have a murmur. I have patients say, I've had a murmur my whole life, so therefore it's meaningless. Yeah. I have to correct them on that. Right. Some people have said, well, I have a murmur. Does that mean I'm in bad shape? Just help us understand right. that. A, a murmur, is, all it is, is us physicians lis listening to the heart and hearing turbulent blood flow. Okay. And the blood can be turbulent in different parts of your heart for a variety of reasons, many of which are very benign and very innocent, and some of which can be problematic. Um, some can be there just because your heart's beating fast and you're, you know, you're active and exercising. You can have a little, what we call, flow murmur. It's very benign and innocent and of no consequence, really. Um, there are certain characteristic changes that we can hear that could be signing to us that it's something more significant. So okay. to say, so I, I guess people can certainly have heart murmurs their whole life and they could be benign or not benign. They could be a problem or not a problem. People could have murmurs later in life that are, you know, not a problem. Or It requires more than okay, just so it's a physical exam sign heard with a stethoscope. Is yeah. that sort of the uh, simplest yeah. way we could say that? Yeah. Okay. It's just representative of turbulent blood flow. Right. For whatever reason. So when the doctors are listening, um, you know, I sometimes say to students I work with that, um, the normal heart sounds, I think people know from their childhood learning in school that the normal heart sounds are lub-dub, mm -hmm. lub-dub. Those are the two doors closing. The valves are closing. Lub-dub are those two different valves closing, two sets of valves closing more accurately. And if we hear a murmur, it might be a noise between there. So it might be lub-should-dub, lub-should-dub, lub-should-dub. Right. And that's the noise the sh is the murmur that we're hearing. And as you said, I think very well, it could be benign, not meaningful, right. especially in a young child who has a thin chest that we can hear very well. It might be, as you said, an innocent murmur or not significant, but it could be significant. Yeah. So take it from there. So now we know what a murmur is. The doctor heard it. What do we do then? Um, and so I'll stick to the case of aortic stenosis, just for the, you know, the sake of this discussion. And there are certain symptoms that we would often ask people about to, to see if there's a significant degree of narrowing or stenosis. Um, and it, People, well, to back up, people can often have sort of vague symptoms. It can be from anything. You can be fatigued or just not as energetic as you often are. But some of the hallmark symptoms or textbook symptoms, people can develop chest pain or angina, uh, you know, pressure in their chest when they try to exert themselves or do something. They could develop shortness of breath or fluid retention, also referred to as congestive heart failure. Um, and it could be so you know, serious enough such where they could pass out, actually. Faint. Faint. And the, the, the fancy word we use for that is syncope, but passing out or fainting, exactly, with exertion more commonly what we're talking about. Uh, when people try to do things, okay. they, one all, way... Uh, all of these signs, which we, now we know, uh, if they're being caused by this problem, is failure for the heart to get blood out that main outlet valve. So right. the outlet valve is stuck, the person's working hard, and... They faint because enough blood's not going to their brain, for Precisely. instance, right. as an example. Right, the same thing. Just like with the angina or the chest pain, the heart has arteries as well that, are, you know, the heart needs oxygen to pump strongly, and those arteries aren't getting the blood it wants either. Um, there may be some other causes for it as well, but that's the easiest way to, to really get at it, that the heart valve's not opening enough to allow enough blood flow out to meet the body's demands and needs, and also, consequently, you can think of it as things backing up in the system, and that's where the fluid retention comes into play as well. Okay. Those are serious symptoms. If one has those symptoms um, with these underlying valve problems, that can often be a need to intervene upon it, meaning corrective surgery, which we can talk about certainly. Okay. Um, other symptoms that we should talk about? I think those are the main hallmark symptoms. Right. That, so. you know, that, and, and sometimes it's a little tricky as one gets older. Um, there, people are in varying states of health. Some people may not be as active, sure. more sedentary, so it's a little tricky sometimes to to really tease out those symptoms with exertion. Right. Um, I think the biggest one that's difficult to tease out, as I'm sure you, you're familiar with, with your own patients, is the issue of shortness of breath right. because patients can often attribute it to that they feel like they're getting a little older or they're out of shape, and those can certainly be explanations, right. but it could also be for this underlying problem, and that really makes it difficult for us, and we have to be candid with patients. We can't always be sure. Right. And so uh, 
the next step from here is often some diagnostic tests that we take care of. And I think I have a graphic prepared just to show some of the different tests that we routinely do. Okay. Um, and it all starts with the physical exam. So obviously keeping frequent visits with your doctor is very important in general for screening these types of problems. And when you're at the doctor's office, you often get an EKG. And that's what's depicted in the upper left uh, corner. And an EKG really is just checking the heart's uh, the heart has an underlying electrical system, and this is looking at that electrical system. It can pick up a lot of different things. It may very well be completely normal in somebody with aortic stenosis, but sometimes people who've had this heart valve problem, because the heart's working harder, the heart muscle can thicken a little bit, and you can see that on an EKG. An EKG is very simple. It's done very quickly in the office. Uh, patients will often just have to remove their shirt, and they'll have uh, electrodes, little stickers placed on their chest, and um, takes just a few seconds after that's oh. done, and you get the snapshot, which provides us a lot of information. Uh, people will often be referred for chest x-rays, for example, when they complain of shortness of breath. And in aortic stenosis, the chest x-ray may be completely normal. Uh, it's quite possible. But you can also sometimes see, as an indicator of the underlying problem of calcification, you can actually sometimes see the calcified valve or calcifications in other arteries in the chest as well. It, it doesn't clinch any diagnosis by any means, but it may just give you an idea as to how severe the problem might be. Um, but on the other hand, I guess I would want to just say for our audience that they're not that reassuring either, I think, because you've already said that. But no. I just want to emphasize that if you had a normal EKG and a normal uh, chest X-ray, we wouldn't be so reassured that, that no, you could... Absolutely not. These are not diagnostic tests. They're, they're sort of they're, they're part of the, the evaluation, uh, but by no means do they exclude or include the diagnosis by any means. The next test that I would talk about which there's a picture of uh, as well in that graphic, is something referred to as an echocardiogram. It's in the lower left corner, uh, also referred to often as an ultrasound of the heart. It's very simple to do, which makes it a very appealing test. There's really no uh, downside to it. There's no risks to the test. Uh, it's an ultrasound, so some gel is applied to the chest wall, and the technician uh, has a probe which delivers ultrasonography, and you can acquire really nice images of the heart. And in addition to that, you can uh, learn a lot about velocities within the heart and turbulent blood flow and if there's leakiness in the heart valves. And so I think that actually is really the mainstay of our diagnostic, uh, our diagnostic armamentarium, if you will, of what we can do to diagnose this, that you can very clearly see the, these um, leaflets of the heart valve thickened and not opening well. And then you can assess how severe it is. Right, very specific measurements yeah. we have a capacity. Yeah, to. very potent, very good, very accurate, very reliable right. uh, way of assessing how severe the blockage is. Essentially, the way we do that is you can measure the speed of blood going across that valve. The faster it is, the more narrow it suggests that it is. And it's more complicated than that, but that's essentially what we're doing. Sure. And uh, it's a very useful test to assess how severe. The, uh, I would say it's the test. I mean, I think you're, yeah, you're, right. I'm I mean, I think you're being yeah. almost modest yeah. to say, yeah. I mean, if of all the four tests that you sh showed, right. if I was, yeah, know, that's the test. if I was stuck yeah. on a deserted island, I right. one test, that would be the one I'd want. I, I could live without all the other tests. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's the gold standard test that we use nowadays, sure. absolutely. Uh, and the beauty of it is it's very simple, and it's done without any uh, downside to it. There's no risk to the very test safe, at all. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you get enormous amounts of other information that, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and the last test that's on that, um, on that graphic is something referred to as a cardiac catheterization. And uh, it's, it, you can tell by the picture alone that's certainly something more invasive. And I think nowadays, truthfully, because of how good echocardiography has become, that uh, that test is largely um, used when one is possibly going to surgery. Because it can also do a lot of different things. It, um, and maybe I should have you describe this a little bit more since this is your, this is your specialty. You're an invasive cardiologist. But uh, what kind of things can we get out of this? Um... Well, I would say practically the way this is used is not as a diagnostic tool, right. but I think you said very well, just as a final step before going to the surgical procedure. Because right. the only question we really are answering at the catheterization is, we already are confident we need the valve replacement based on the evaluation by you, the right. cardiologist, and the echocardiogram. So we put those two things together. So the question is, when you have your heart valve replaced, might you also need something else done, like right. a heart bypass of your blocked arteries? Right. So that's really the, it's almost not even the aortic valve we're looking at, although we are, it's uh, really less important for that as it is right. for this other piece. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, I always tell people, if they're, you're gonna have open heart surgery for your valve, it makes sense to also know what the coronary arteries are, just so that you don't show up a year later with another problem right. with the coronary arteries. Right. So 
Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I guess that brings us sort of to our next point in this discussion, maybe the treatment for this. Sure. Um, and well, maybe just can we just there's a picture you have you, you have a beautiful graphic of actually pictures of what these valves oh, look like. Yeah. So let's put that graphic up, and I think that would be great if we put that graphic up and then just briefly there's, talk there's about. A, there's actually a different one than this one that um, shows a couple of surgical samples from the operating room of a... Aortic stenosis is the title of this graphic. And just to briefly say, maybe you and I could talk about the, the size of this valve and what we think about briefly um, the size of the narrowings and that kind of thing. What, what, what's significant in that regard? Right, so the way, just to orient the viewers to this, on the left side of your screen is what is referred to as a typical aortic valve, the tricuspid aortic valve. And you could, I, I think you can appreciate there are three leaflets, and in the middle is a very small, narrow opening. And those leaflets are all calcified and thickened. And on the right, there are, there are only two leaflets. And that's the bicuspid aortic valve, as it's labeled. And those are also thickened and restricted as well. And we can make measurements before one ever ends up in the operating room with echocardiography or with catheterization of how narrow that, or, or how, um, or how narrow that valve really is, how poorly it opens. Yes. And um, I don't know if it's worth getting the specifics of what measure the numbers are, but... Um, well, I, I, I generally tell patients that we use a number of two as the normal, normal size, sure. um, just for those who are technically interested, it's centimeters, centimeters squared. squared. Yeah. So that's a little less than an inch squared is the normal opening. And uh, we would say that that's normal. And then take it away from there, what sort of right. beyond There's that? There's a lot of different gradations you can use, but one could talk about mild, moderate, severe, and critical. Uh -huh. uh, and you can often consider, to make it simple, anything less than one centimeter square, you can often consider a severe uh -huh. aortic stenosis. So about half normal size. Yeah, okay. and, and then after that, you, you're, it's becoming semantics at that point right. to debate between severe and critical and right. you know, 0 0.7 centimeter square, 0.8. I think largely what becomes important are your symptoms. Yeah. You, know, you could have... Uh, aortic valve area of one centimeter square and have no symptoms, right. it's important to know and requires you know, um, frequent and regular follow-up with your doctor. And uh -huh. I don't think we touched on that, and, and maybe I'll deviate off this sure. topic for a second sure. on that, and that um, you know, one, once one is diagnosed with this problem, it does warrant continued evaluation. So certainly visiting with a cardiologist makes sense when one has you know, maybe moderate aortic stenosis. Um, because there's certain signs and symptoms that we really are in tune to and trying to pick up, but also that ultrasound test, the echocardiogram. Uh, once you have it, depending on how severe it may be, you may get it in two years again to check on it again, or one year, or if some symptoms change, maybe sooner. Uh, so that's a very important test to follow up sure. upon, absolutely. Uh, it's the gold standard way of following up okay. upon it. But getting back to that graphic, I think... Uh, I think we finished talking for the most part about I think we that. did. Yeah. So I think you've done a really great job summarizing that we have patients that come to us because usually a heart murmur, possibly signs and symptoms, identifications with the ultrasound or echocardiogram. We talked about how the valve narrowing can be specifically and accurately measured with the ultrasound mm -hmm. and then followed until it becomes either so severe that we get worried about it or it becomes severe enough and there's associated symptoms. Right. And, the and symptoms, then where do we go with that? And the symptoms are very important to pick up upon because once one develops these symptoms, there are well-documented statistics about how long you can go before you run into a real problem, in other right. words, dying, Death, yes. uh, without any sort of intervention upon. So if you develop chest pain suggestive of angina, you know, pressure, right. heart failure, you know, fluid retention, shortness of breath, or fainting, those are pretty ominous signs that tell us that it's time to get this valve fixed. Sure. And if not, you have a high chance of you know, passing away within the next two, three, five years right. in that range. And, well, and, I'm and older than you, so I'll tell you that when I was training, I was told that in many times the, uh, the uh, risk of death is higher waiting for surgery than it is for surgery because there was less availability for cardiac surgery 20 right. years ago, 30 years ago. And while patients waited a week or month or two months for surgery, there was higher death rates than just going ahead and having surgery. Yeah, I'd like to think, I don't, I don't think that problem exists I now. Agree. I agree, I agree. That uh, yeah. especially where we live or sure. where we're located, we have right. access to, right. to tremendous I amounts agree. of things. Um, so, anyways, getting to, to the, the treatment stage of this. Mm -hmm. So, it'd be great to be able to take a medicine for this, and really, there's no medication that treats this. There's some hope or some thought that uh, this class of medications called statins, cholesterol medicines, that maybe it could influence uh, the progression of aortic stenosis. There's some small little studies looking at that, but nothing so powerful that we would lean on that as a real 
treatment for this. Um, so that's something that's being looked at. But the real mainstay of treatment is surgery. And there are some centers that are dabbling in aortic valve repair, where they go in, debride it or get rid of the calcium and fix the valve, and, and, and that's it. But that's not so common. Typically what happens is the valve has to be replaced. And there are different types of replacements or prostheses that we use. The, the, the device, mechanical valves, uh, which are made up of steel and other, uh, other, other components. And then there are tissue valves as well. And they can come from a lot of things. There are, you know, people refer to them as pig valves, um, so porcine valves, or bovine valves coming from a cow, or um, the other species as well. And uh, there are different reasons why one might choose one or the other. Uh, I think one important thing to note is that if you are to have a mechanical valve in place, you are committed to lifelong blood thinning medication. So that's an important distinction. A medicine commonly called Coumadin or Warfarin. Right, and that's, you know, there's, there's um, the, the, the pro to that type of valve, though, the benefit, though, is it's thought that it lasts longer than forever. the tissue valve. Right, essentially forever. Um, and the tissue valves are getting better and better, lasting longer and longer. Okay. Um, and, and the tissue valve is um, something that doesn't require the blood thinning or the Coumadin medication. So that's a, a nice option for sure. maybe people who are older um, and, and don't need it to last 40 years, 30, 25, 30 years sure. or something. Um, so surgery is really the only option uh, for this. And it's becoming a much more um, well-tolerated procedure. Uh, there, as, as every year passes, there are uh, less and less invasive approaches. Uh, as with all cardiac surgery. Uh, and, and in fact, there are even now things being looked at where you could do it um, catheter, uh, in a catheter-based approach. And maybe I'll have you explain a little bit about that since you're the... Well, I think the, we're running out of time, oh, okay. so I think that we might be able to just sum up with that yeah. to say that I think you've done a really beautiful job summarizing this issue of aortic stenosis, a problem that occurs uh, more commonly in older folks. Uh, it happens uh, with increasing frequency with each decade of life. We see it commonly in our practices. Mm -hmm. Aortic stenosis is a problem of a narrowing of the main outlet valve. The main symptoms we worry about are anginal chest pain or pressure or heaviness in your chest, shortness of breath or fainting. It's identified with a heart murmur as a first step, but ultimately with that ultrasound or echocardiography. And then careful follow-up by your cardiologist with ultimately a referral for some kind of corrective measure, which at this point is surgery, which is a great therapy. Patients recover, do very well in the long run, and we think uh, are the right things to do. And I'm sure you saw recently in the paper, uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger of California just celebrated his 10th anniversary after aortic valve surgery. So there's a, 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 a representative of a, a great success in aortic valve replacement. So thanks very much, Dr. Srivastava, right. for joining me thank and uh, reviewing this topic. So thank you again for uh, being with us for this edition of Matters of the Heart on Aortic Stenosis. Please join us again for the next edition. For uh, uh, Patekin Medical Cardiology, I'm Seth Villazarian. Thank you.